so that that was just my introduction oh i've got to be careful with the time that was just my introduction to, with the focus on grammar and to give you an idea of how a communicative grammar developed evolved and how it differs from a traditional linguistic grammar okay I'm now going to have a short overview, run through a short over, historical overview of um, how we moved from grammar translation, which was up, prior, up in, until the middle of the 20th century, um, um, after, uh, until on about the 1950s. And the 1940s changed all of this because during the Second World War, the armed forces Need, who were dropped into enemy territory needed to be able to speak the language of the country where they were being dropped, parachuted into, and they needed to be able to pretend to be almost native speakers of the language of that country. So a grammar translation approach wasn't going to give them that, okay? Grammar translation approach is focused on written texts and on learning the rules of grammar. If you're going to communicate as a near native speaker, you've got to be able to speak your pronunciation has to be accurate. Your forms have to be what the locals are using. So there was a move away from grammar translation that slowly developed to what we now know as communicative language teaching. And in the 1970s, that was even more the case because in the 1970s, people became economically better off and so they were able to travel more. This was particularly the case in Europe, which is where the communicative language teaching approach originated. So people in Europe became more able to travel um, around the continent of Europe, and they wanted to have basic communication um, sentences, if you like, expressions, phrases so that when they were at the hotel or at the restaurant or at the post office or asking for directions, they'd be able to do all of those functions. They're all language functions. They'd be able to do those in the target language. Um, and this was particularly the case for tourists from England going to Europe, okay? So the British, like the Australians, are notorious for being really bad language learners. OK, so um, people thought that if they were given these phrases, these situational and functional approaches when they did their course, their little tourist courses in a language in French or German or Dutch or Spanish or, or Italian, they'd be able to function in certain situations. And they didn't need to learn all of the rules of the grammar. They just needed to know the grammatical structures that were associated with particular functions like asking for and receiving information. Um, how do I get to, where's the railway station? What time does the bus leave? That kind of thing, okay? Um, or at the post office for sending a parcel back home, how much does it cost to send this parcel to wherever they were going? So how much does it cost to send this parcel from um, Samarang to Melbourne in Australia. So they just learned, if you like, standard phrases. And that allowed learners to pick up enough language to communicate at a very basic level with native speakers during travel, but also in work. And this is why it's a very European concept, because in the 1970s, with the development of, of the European economic community, um, the e European Union, people, particularly business people, were expected to go and work in different countries. And so they needed to have a basic level of language to be able to communicate with native speakers in those countries. Because the European Union had three languages, English, French, and German, then you needed to be able to have some basic knowledge of um, those languages as you moved around the continent of Europe. Okay, next slide, please. Oops. Okay, more recently, I've skipped over a, a whole lot, but I'm going to come back to it um, later, okay? Sorry, next slide, thank you. No, oh, no, the one before that, sorry. 
the task-based learning one. So um, those initial uh, functional notional approaches to developing a learner's second or foreign language were not very satisfying from the point of view of the level of English or the other language that people developed. And so um, other approaches, which I'm going to come to later on, were, um, were introduced. Okay, so that was just a brief historical overview of how we moved from a traditional grammar translation focus on grammatical rules to communication. The second reason I believe uh, is that there was a need to respond to global challenges. So this starts in maybe in around the mid 1990s. The impact of globalization meant that people would not be able to get by as they moved around from country to country with just a basic set of phrases, of tourist phrases, if you like. They needed a higher level of language proficiency, better linguistic, so better grammar and better communicative competence, um, which involved understanding the sociocultural um, sociocultural understanding, sociocultural ways uh, that they needed to be able to operate within in a more globalised world. So there was a need for higher levels of authenticity in language teaching approaches and in the learning materials that were being used. But that meant that there had to be a, a different approach to the concept of grammar, to the rules of language. And so that's why globalisation the global movements, particularly in terms of businesses, big companies, um, really pushed the, the people who were developing English language courses to a higher level to look at different topics, different ways of teaching and learning, and different ways of approaching grammar, grammatical knowledge and competence. The borderless global economic trends um, what I mean by that is you didn't you didn't need to travel to, for work. Although um, let's uh, okay, let's take Singapore as a really good example. Okay, um, from the 1990s and it's still the case today, Singapore became a focal area, a focal city, um, country for international um, corporations, and so people coming to work in Singapore for big companies had to have a really good level of English language. But even if they didn't go and travel, if they, and, and they would come to Singapore for a certain period of time, maybe five years, maybe three years. It wasn't for life, okay? But they needed to come with a high level of English so that they would be competent in the, in the area where they were working and in the company that they were working for. As well as that, and because of this, English developed as a world language or a global lingua franca, in other words, the shared language across the world. But what that then meant, and the work of um, Katru um, is very important in this, was that there was no longer just one English with one set of grammatical rules and one set of, set of pronunciations. There were many different Englishes with different grammars because a mobile workforce as developed from the 1990s and continued up to uh, before COVID started meant that, that that mobile workforce needed a common language for communication. So it was still important to think about standard English grammar English language learners had to also be made aware that that standard English grammar wasn't going to be um, the grammar of all users of English. So we talk about Indian English, we talk about Singaporean English, um, we talk about constructed languages like Chinglish, the English that um, people from in China use when they communicate. Um, we talk about Japlish, which is what Japanese uses um, of English use, it's not, it's 
based on the key rules or grammatical structures of English, but it's not quite the same as the standard British English or American English. Or, and Australian English is another example. Australian English doesn't necessarily follow the same standard structures, um, particularly in the way that it's produced in speech, in oral communication, as um, standard British or American English, if you like. Okay, next slide, please. Another important impact that we, oops, sorry, next one. Another important um, feature that we have to take into account is the impact of mass migration. So mass migration has brought a huge diversity um, in terms of, oops, no, one before that, sorry. Yep, mass migration has brought a huge diversity, particularly in cities uh, where, uh, that, because that's where migrants um, tend to congregate. They tend to prefer to live in cities because they've got access to more services than they would have if they moved to the country, to country areas. Um, and that's the case in most in countries across the Western world in particular. And I'm sure it's the same in Asia as well. There's better access to education. And that means that the migrants are going to school with people from, with children, and the same with adult classes, children from many different first language backgrounds. And this has led to the rise of plurilingualism or multilingualism as being a natural phenomenon in many countries. So in many countries, um, large numbers of people are no longer monolingual, they're bilingual, trilingual. Um, some people, for example, the African migrants who come to Australia speak about five languages. So all of that needed to be taken into account in the teaching of English and in the development of new English language courses, both for second language learners, so people learning the language in the country where English is the dominant language or the native language, but also in English as foreign language environments, because many of the students like you and your students will be traveling or will be encountering people from very many different backgrounds who speak a range of different Englishes, okay? The rise of technology, also the new technologies ha, um, has been strongly associated with English. Um, and English in particular is a popular vehicular language, the popular language of communication in non-English speaking countries among young people. And if we look at the impact of things like pop music, um, pop music videos, um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, SMS, emails, internet, even TikTok, okay, um, we see that a lot, most of those, um, the interactions between young people occur in English. And those young people don't necessarily have near native competence in English. They might be beginners, they might be at intermediate level. They've got some knowledge of English. What they don't know to be grammatically correct, they make up. And so that's in that way we get an, another lot of English grammars developing. The impact is not just on the vocabulary, but also on grammatical structures. So as I've said here, there's no longer one standard English grammar, but many grammars for different forms of communication. And so how do we cater with, for that? How do we cope with that in um, countries like Indonesia in secondary school and particularly at university where you have um, national examinations that you have to pass? How do we cater for the fact that, okay, you've got these national examinations and many countries have those which expect that you as students will produce what's known as standard English, um, grammatical English, Whereas when you're out with your friends in cafes or restaurants or when you're on your computer and you're engaging in Twitter or Facebook or SMSs or um, Zoom communications or FaceTime on phones, then 
the language that you use doesn't necessarily have to depend on you producing grammatical standard English sentences. As long as you can get your message across, the purpose of communication, the meaning is clear, the person or the people you're communicate, interacting with, communicating with, understand your message, they share um, the meaning of what you're trying to put across. You don't have to be speaking or SMSing or emailing using what we consider to be acceptable, correct standard English grammar. So that there's a lot now for teachers of English as a second or foreign language. There's a lot to think about. There's a lot to consider when we're developing courses, when we're providing authentic materials to students to enable them to develop their knowledge, their knowledge and their level of competence in English. It's really challenging. And I'll come back to that as um, when I talk about the challenges at the end. Okay. All right. Um, moving on now to some definitions. So hopefully I've, I've in what we, I've gone through so far, hopefully I've shown you why there has been this big move since the 1970s, mid-1970s, and it really has um, increased in pace and movement in, in the 2000s, 2010s, and now the 2020s. So there's a huge impact of a number of different factors and forces which are, are influencing in particular not just the vocabulary, the lexical items, but also the grammatical rules of what we know as the English language. And so we can't, we can no longer think about the one and only English language, but as I said, we need to think about numerous English languages which share some common features but have some differences as well. Okay, in terms of teaching and learning, what has that meant? So if we go back to the 1980s, then what was considered to be really important was the development of communicative competence. How do learners of English, how are learners of English going to become competent, proficient in English so that they can interact and communicate with not just native speakers, but also non-native speakers of English? So Canali and Swain, who were two um, Canadian researchers, came up with this concept of communicative competence. And they said that that consisted of four important elements, linguistic or grammatical competence. So you've got to know the structures of the language. You've got to know the system. You've got to know which order to put the words in, in order to produce what people recognise as an English sentence rather than um, perhaps a Japanese sentence or an Arabic sentence or an Indonesian sentence. You've got to have sociolinguistic competence. In other words, you've got to know what are the rules that govern social interactions? What are the rules that tell me what's appropriate when I'm interacting with another person? What's appropriate when I'm interacting with a native speaker of English? What's appropriate when I'm interacting through English with a non-native speaker, depending on which country that person comes from? So um, I don't know if you've ha had the experience of having interactions with Italian or Spanish speakers, but I find um, like this, the social distance, the distance between you as a speaker and them as the interlocutor as the person you're interacting with is much smaller than it is in English. In English, we tend to um, be at least a hand, an arm length apart from the person we're talking to. We're not kind of nose to nose, but Italian and Spanish speakers have a much smaller social distance. It's all those kinds of things that we have to learn as well. Appropriate um, forms of addressing people, okay? How do you respectfully address a teacher um, from an, another country in English? What's the appropriate form of address? How do you interact with older people um, who in many societies are treated 
very, very respectfully, much more respectfully than we treat them here in Australia. So sociolinguistic competence, discourse competence. This is really, really important these days. What are the rules that govern how speech and written text are organised? So what's a logical sequence? How do you change topics when you're speaking with someone? Um, in other words, how do you and how do you take turns? How do you how does the person you're interacting with know when they can interrupt, when they can um, respond to what you're saying? In written discourse, what's the appropriate form for a formal letter, for example, which is one of the tasks I've given you, as opposed to a personal letter or an informal one or a business letter? Strategic competence, and this refers to um, the spoken interactions. Um, it's the ability to repair breakdowns in communication. So you've tried to put your message across. The person you're interacting with shows by the look on their face or the fact that they haven't responded, that they haven't really understood what you're trying to say, or they might have been offended. Um, and you have to um, you have to be able to repair that breakdown in communication and you have to know how to do that in English. And lastly, uh, pragmatic competence, and this was a later addition by an American researcher in assessment and in second language acquisition, um, Lyle Barkman, pragmatic competence. The ability to infer or interpret meaning within specific contexts. And that goes back to what I was talking about um, several minutes ago in terms of uh, locutionary, uh, interloc illocutionary and perlocutionary effects. So how does your knowledge of English language grammar enable you to infer or interpret meaning within a specific context. So let's take an example of that. So um, let's say that uh, you've just arrived in Australia or America or New Zealand or Britain at a university where you're going to do a course and you've gone to your appointment with the lecturer in charge of the course that you're going to be doing to choose your subjects. So you've learned English at secondary school, maybe primary school as well, and at university. So you've got lots of vocab knowledge, you know about English sentence, grammatical rules, what's correct and not correct. But does that actually enable you to understand, to interpret the meaning of what the person in charge of the course might say to you where um, it does, you don't understand because the language that person uses, so the words and the sentence structures don't fit with what you've learned. So we need to give learners of English lots of different contexts in which they are exposed to the language uh, as or and, and where they can also use the language. So those five elements are really important for um, teachers to think about when they're designing their courses in English as a foreign or second language. Okay, next slide, thank you. So in relation to the development of communicative competence, Sandra Savignon, an American researcher um, who's very well known, has come up with seven principles of communicative language teaching for the 21st century. So the basic one is language is a tool for communication. Language is not just a set of grammatical rules, it's actually a tool. And the purpose of that tool is to enable communication to take place between people, both native speakers of English, native speakers and non-native speakers, and not, and, um, uh, for a, a, a wide group of non-native speakers who have come together and whose common language is English, okay? So language is a tool for communication. Diversity is recognised and accepted as part of 
de the development of English as a second or foreign language. And that goes back to what I said before, that due to globalisation and the impact of global movements, that there are now a number of English grammars, not just one grammar, and that's accepted. Learners are relatively competent. In other words, learners, it's accepted that all learners ha can have different levels of competence in terms of their production of genres, of styles of language and grammatical correctness, okay? So style is related to um, how you know how to address someone who's considered to be your superior, your boss in a business firm, an older person in a social situation, a university lecturer in an academic situation. I've talked about multiple varieties of language being recognised in terms of multiple English grammars, but that's also the case for vocabulary. Savignon says that culture is instrumental. In other words, culture is an instrument for developing a way of developing competence in the language. And culture is not just static. Culture changes all the time. There's not just one English culture, and you already know that, uh, but as well as the standard view that there's an American, a, a British, an Australian, a New Zealand culture, there are also cultures there's for example people talk about a middle eastern culture in english which is not the same as a british one or an american one okay it's specific to that context that environment so the wide use of english in the middle east has meant that a culture associated with that use where the ways and the expectations of behavior the socio-cultural and sociolinguistic competence in English reflects Middle Eastern ways, not British or American ones. And so that's really important as well. So that understanding of culture, of sociocultural elements is also very important. This is important for teachers. There's no single methodology for language teaching or learning or set of prescribed techniques. So that does not make life easy for people who are teachers, okay? Um, in the past, for example, in the audiolingual period in the 1960s, there was one accepted methodology and that was called audiolingualism. And you had dialogues that were learned by heart, exercises and drills um, that drilled patterns, particular grammatical rules or patterns in the language in English. And that was what you had to use. I did my teacher training um, right in the middle of the popularity of audiolingual approaches. Um, and my exam for, um, for teaching to pass my methods and practice of teaching la languages, I did French, was I had to be able to use the tape recorder with the tape dialogue on it to stop it at the right place to get the students to repeat the sentences um, after the tape, and then to do the exercises. Things have changed these days. Now there are a there is a range of different methodologies, ways of teaching and learning for uh, English for English as a second or foreign language. And what we're encouraged to do is to adapt our methodology to the learners in front of us. But that means that standardised exams are not the norm, okay? So in countries where there is still a, a standardised exam that all students have to um, sit for, then we, we can't just ha say there's a variety of methodologies. We have to have a methodology that gets students ready to be successful in that exam. But at the same time, and this is a challenge, we have to be able to prepare them for using English in the real world outside of the exam situation. And we accept these days the goal of learning English as a, another language is using the language as well as learning the language. So 
language as a tool for communication means we have to be able to use that language. So we have to be able to enable our learners, our students, to be comfortable in using the language in a large variety of situations that take into consideration sociocultural features as well as the pragmatic features. Okay, so what do these principles mean for communicative English grammar teaching? Well, first of all, I think that um, the choice of topic and the texts um, have to have a balance between a focus on meaning and a focus on form. In other words, a focus on getting your message across and getting that done in grammatically acceptable ways. It also means that, learn, that students learn the language in authentic interactive settings with a focus on communication. So what does that mean for the way in which we design courses, the way in which we design lessons? We're going to have a look at that later on in this session in the two tasks that I've given you as samples. I'm just going to have a quick drink of water, okay? I'm running out of voice. Oops. Okay, next slide. Um, please tell me if you'd like a breather because I've covered a lot of stuff so far, okay? So I've looked at um, the difference between a communicative English grammar and a traditional English grammar. I've looked at the changes, the historical development, the move away from an emphasis on teaching grammatical, standard grammatical forms, grammar rules, in um, an English language course at school or university. I've looked at how communicative language teaching came into being, what it, what's meant by communicative competence, the five components of communicative competence, taking a small look at what a communicative language teaching approach might look like in designing a course and in designing lessons. And now I'm going to go back to a focus on the grammatical aspect, okay? So, um, oh, and the references are at the end of this for you to look at later on. So one, one of the big debates in moving from a focus um, on a grammatical approach to the teaching and learning of English as a foreign or second language to a communicative approach and the development of a communicative grammar, one of the big debates has been how much time and effort should a teacher put into teaching explicit grammatical forms so that students when they produce the language, don't produce language which is full of mistakes or grammatical errors. And, and the same, what I'm going to say about um, this in terms of grammar also applies to pronunciation, okay? Um, but I'm just going to focus on grammar today because that's that's the topic. Okay, so there's a there's been a very big debate since the mid-1990s, and it continues today, on how much a teacher should explicitly teach grammatical forms and how much a teacher should ignore that and let the learners develop their understanding of the grammar implicitly. So let me just quickly take you to why this particular debate arose in the 1990s, in the mid-1990s. So a lot of research on the acquisition of English as a second language in particular, not so much as a foreign language because um, foreign language learning occurred in classrooms, but second language acquisition occurred both in classrooms in an English-speaking country but outside of those classrooms, because the learners had access to English 
in the environment outside the classroom, as well as in the formal area context of the classroom. A lot of the early research in the 1980s and 1990s was on learners acquiring, in other words, or picking up English and the mistakes or errors they made in grammar when that happened. And taking that acquisition approach into the classroom, so what that meant was teachers um, provided learners with input, with activities which enabled them to interact with each other in English, but that the grammatical forms weren't taught prior to those activity, classroom activities. And the consequence of that was that learners were developing an English which um, native speakers considered was full of mistakes or grammatical errors. But the rationale from some researchers was, but that's what happens when you allow someone to just pick up English by interacting with people in the community. They don't pick up the correct grammar straight away. It takes a long time, okay? So instructed second or foreign language learning, so English learned in the classroom, both in foreign and second language contexts, should help learners to reach a gram grammar error-free level of competence in the language more quickly than just letting them pick it up outside the classroom in the community. And using that approach, using that acquisition, let's um, enable them to pick up the language naturally in the classroom as well, was not working very well, particularly when you had um, learners who had to sit for exams where the expectation was that their English language was going to be fairly non, it was going to be fairly error-free, fairly similar to a native speaker. Mind you, native speakers make gra grammatical errors as well. It depends on their level of education, how much reading they do outside the classroom, how much correction of their errors takes place by their parents, um, by other people, teachers, other people in the community. So it was kind of um, a flawed rationale, if you like, for allowing English to be just picked up in the classroom rather than having some sort of focus on grammatical forms, grammatical rules and, and help and drawing learners' attention to what was correct versus what was incorrect. So there, there was this debate in the mid-1990s about whether a form-focused approach, so that's where the grammar is taught in isolation from meaning and use, the basis of traditional courses where you taught the pre simple present tense, then the definite and indefinite articles, then the present progressive tense, then the past tense, okay? And then after the students had learned all of those grammatical items, you then... Um, gave them a role play to do or gave them some, an information gap activity or a problem solving activity so that they could practice the um, grammar that they'd learned. So some studies like the morphine studies that Crash and Julie and Bert did um, and my master's, my first master's thesis at Monash was based on those studies um, and the developmental sequences research that Peenemann did in Germany showed that learners didn't acquire English grammatical forms in the same order in which they were presented in um, traditional classes. So learners didn't pick up, didn't learn the simple present tense, then the definite and indefinite articles, then the present progressive, then the past tense. In fact, the past tense occurred a lot earlier, okay, because you learn what you have to use. Okay, you don't necessarily learn what you're being taught if you're not using it. Um, and if you're not using it in authentic, meaningful contexts, which is the basis of communicative language teaching. 
So that's the form-focused approach. So a form-focused approach is where you teach the grammar and then after that you've done all a lot of that grammar, then you lead the students to using the language. Rather than the other way around, a focus on form approach has the learners engaging meaning first in activities where they have to convey a message. And then the linguistic elements needed for that message to be conveyed effectively are um, drawn to the learner's attention. So it's it's called um, awareness raising or consciousness raising about particular grammatical forms in English, the forms that are needed, the linguistic elements that are needed um, to produce a, a target-like language more quickly. I hope that's making sense. Okay, next slide. Please. Okay, so these are... Um, these are a couple of questions which researchers who promoted a focus on form approach and those who promoted a form-focused approach, so um, meaning first, grammar second, or grammar first, meaning second, asked. So should teachers plan in advance to focus on a particular form? That's a proactive approach. So before you give the students a problem-solving activity or an information gap activity, should you actually teach, explicitly teach them a particular form? Or should a teacher wait until the learners continually make mistakes with a particular form and then teach them the cor correct grammatical rule and the grammatical form, which is called a reactive approach? Doughty and Williams suggest that in contexts where students face formal assessment of their language learning, it might be, be best to use a combination of these two approaches. In fact, it's my personal belief that in any context, a combination of these two approaches is the optimal approach to developing students' knowledge and awareness of English grammatical forms. So you need both. In some cases, you need a proactive approach. If you don't want the learners to be frustrated by not being able to produce acceptable or, um, language or language that the, their people, that their interlocutors, the people they're interacting with can understand, then you need to take a proactive approach. But if the learners are confident and if they're getting their meaning across, even though they're making quite a few grammatical errors, then you can use a reactive approach. You can let them um, you can let them interact, you can let them take part participate in an activity. You look, you got you look at what the errors that they're making, and then you draw their attention to the correct grammatical forms post the activity they've engaged in. I think that this is an important point. It's easier to focus on a form, focus on a particular grammatical um, element or item during input when students' receptive skills, so their listening or their reading, are being developed. Because in order to understand without feeling frustrated, what they're hearing or what they're reading, they will need to know um, the particular structures that they're going to um, encounter in the listening exercise or, or in the read in reading the text. Another aspect of this focus on form versus form focused approach was how to deal with students' errors um, in productive skills, particularly or both in speech and writing. So um, Roy Lister talks about corrective feedback. Um, he's done quite a lot of work on the impact of corrective feedback using different sorts of approaches. For example, clarification requests. So a learner says something or writes something, teacher doesn't understand it, and the teacher asks, Do, did you mean this or this? That's a clarification request. Or the teacher might repeat the learner error. Um, I go to 
um, the beach yesterday um, and the teacher says, I go to the beach yesterday or I went and then elicit a response with a correction in or I went to the beach yesterday. Okay, yep, thank you for the question. I'll come to the questions at the end. I'll speed up soon. So in dealing, so there are different ways. Um, List has come up with about six ways of um, six different forms of corrective feedback, but it appears that clarification requests, repetition of learner, the learner's mistake and elicitation of the response with the correction in it are the most successful ways of focusing on grammatical forms, grammatical items. Next slide, please. Okay, so in developing communicative competence, we saw before that Savignon suggests seven principles of communicative language teaching. What do those seven principles actually mean in terms of what you do in the classroom? So it's been shown, and this goes right back to crashing in 1982, a long time ago, that comprehensible input is absolutely necessary for learners to acquire a second or a foreign language. So um, if the input is beyond the learner's level, both in terms of vocabulary and grammar, they're not going to um, learn the language. But input alone can't ensure that a second language will be learned. So you can't just develop the student's receptive skills, their listening and their reading. You it's got to be more than that. Okay, so the first step is to ensure that the input, the language that they're going, the examples of language that they're going to be given and work with are comprehensible. In other words, at a level where um, they um, can understand that. It has to be challenging, can't be too easy, can't, but it can't be too difficult. Secondly, in order for um, a language to be learned, so Meryl Swain talks about the necessity of negotiation of meaning. Learners have to be able to interact with the language input and with other people in a way that enables them to notice or be aware of particular linguistic forms in order for the input to become what's called intake, in other words, comprehensible. And then the third and really important step is that the, um, the learners have to be placed, have to be given opportunities for comprehensible output. So they have to be able to use the language so that they can um, test their hypotheses, um, they can understand what grammatical rules they still don't really get and they need more teaching about or more learning about. They, In other words, they have to be able to formulate hypotheses about how English works and then test those hypotheses in producing the language comprehensively for other people with other people in terms of spoken language and for other people in terms of written language. What are the implications of that for the classroom? The implications are that as teachers, we need to ensure that learners have as much input as possible that contains the forms they need to learn. And that input needs to be as authentic as possible. Authentic as possible doesn't mean that the teacher can't modify or adapt the texts. It's not possible in a foreign language situation for um, teachers to use totally authentic texts. Um, for example, uh, we often say to our students of French here in Australia, you should watch the French news every morning on the television. Now, that is a very challenge. That certainly that will give them lots of comprehensible input. But the language delivery of news readers and interviewers is very fast. It's fast. I even have trouble difficulty in French as my second language, understanding it all the time. 
and there are no subtitles in the French news. So when you're watching television or going to a movie, subtitles are very useful because as we listen, our brain gets super tired the more listening we have to do, and I'm very conscious of that with you today. Um, so it's really important that there's another sort of support, particularly for listening. It's not as difficult for reading. With reading, you've got the text there. You can go backwards and forwards and over it, over it again. You can't do that with listening. Now, someone says something and it's gone. That's it. You can't recapture it. You can recapture it if you're in a face-to-face -face interaction. But if you're on a Zoom meeting like this or if you're watching television or if you're at the movies, you can't recapture that. You can't press rewind, okay, unless, of course, it's a DVD or something like that. So um, in order to make input comprehensible, sometimes teachers have to adapt that authentic text to the level, the I plus one that um, Krashen was talking about, to the level that the learners can cope with with their input. And that's the same with output. In comprehensible output, um, learners need to feel comfortable that they will be accepted from trying, from making an effort. They don't have to get it right the first time because they know the teacher is going to come back and go over it and do some teaching around that grammatical item or those grammatical items that were incorrect. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now I'm going to move on to two particular ways today in the 21st century that um, English as a foreign language is has been successfully um, taught or and learned. And the first one is task-based language teaching. Task-based language teaching has been a while, around for a while um, and it has been, it's also called in some European countries, it's called project-based learning, okay, um, and it's successful in encouraging learners and enabling them to use the linguistic resources that they've got to construct meaningful language. It uses authentic materials to give learners exposure to real language provides comprehensible input, sometimes at a level a bit more difficult if the teacher's not careful with the types of texts that are recommended, but provides them with the input that they, they need to solve problems and produce comprehensible output. So the initial task-based language teaching approaches were very um, classroom-oriented and very basic, but they've developed a lot over the last 20 years. And one of the good things about task-based language teaching and text-based language teaching that, that I'm going to talk about next is that um, the use of the authentic materials can expose learners to those variations in English that I was talking about before. In other words, teachers can introduce the range of English grammars that have come into existence and that have arisen because of the use of English as a lingua franca. Um, in many countries and in many social contexts. Next slide, please. The second approach, which has been, which has become quite popular over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, is um, what's known as content and language integrated learning, or CLIL. And it's an approach that is used in um, academic um, settings. So, and, and it's based on the use of texts, uh, a lot of written texts, but also oral texts, oral oral texts as well. A range of different texts, actually. A lot of internet use to look at different documents and different thoughts of things. So in a content and language integrated learning approach, Language is the medium of learning, not the object. So I talked about communicative language teaching, language in use, language for meaning are the important concepts around communicative language teaching. 
And content and language integrated learning is seen as the optimal approach that does that because the language is used to learn another subject area like history or science or geography or PE or music. Um, and the discourse of those academic areas express um, authentic meanings and then they create meaning so that at those new meanings which require new language are the focus of the students. Um, it's also a really good way of introducing students to different genres or text types and different registers that are used in language. Um, for ex and CLIL's become really popular in many countries because of that, because it exposes learners to a range of really rich language texts and it pushes them to use the language that they're learning, the vocab and the grammar that they know, both for everyday communication and academic uses. The pedagogical, the teaching and the learning approach for CLIL is based on pair or small group work. The teacher is um, very much a facilitator, organises the activities, all the tasks that the students engage in, and then draws the learnings together um, to focus on the lexical and grammatical errors that have occurred. So it, it employs very much a reactive approach to focus on form that we saw in an earlier slide. For example, um, Science. science subjects involve language for um, a number of different reasons for using language to what we see in the normal English as a foreign English as a second language course, where the focus is on the language, okay? So the focus is on the subject content. So in science, you use language for observing phenomena, for example, how is rain created? Where does it come from? For describing a process, how... Um, ice melts to become water, um, how much heat you have to apply, what's the optimal um, point where it starts to melt to become water. Um, it involves language for testing properties. Um, what are the properties of the melting point of iced water? Um, science, um, science classes require students to produce a procedural recount. So students have to be able to both verbalise orally and then write down the steps in an experiment and the results and provide an, an explanation for what happened. For example, they need sentences like the ice melted when heat was applied or the ice melted because it, um, because it became hot, because the sun shone heavily on it or um, it was put under hot water or it was put in a saucepan and boiled. So different sorts of language from the language that we learn in a course where the focus is on English as a language, not English as a means of conveying information about a subject, a discipline at school. History. History is considered one of the more difficult subject areas to teach through English as a foreign or second language. It has a lot of vocabulary, so you've got to have a lot of vocabulary knowledge. But the good thing about history is that it uses narratives to tell a story. And it's a good way of teaching cause and consequence, um, verbs and um, mark, um, logical markers. History also um, requires students to compare and evaluate the sources of the historical event and provide evidence. Often teachers say that history is more difficult because it requires the use of the past tense. But in English, we're lucky. We have a thing which is a tense which is called the historical present. So begin even beginning or lower intermediate um, learners can actually um, learn history through English because if they're placed in the period they're studying and they imagine that they're a person living and working and functioning every day in that particular historical period, imagining their life, that they're living there, then they can use that historical present tense, 
okay so i'm i'm an a rome i'm a teenager in ancient rome in whatever year bc it is um this is what my home looks like this is what i do every day this is what i eat these are the sports activities so you can actually get away at the beginning with this historical present tense both science and history require the use of sequ sequential marking words, such as at first, firstly, and then next, et cetera, okay? So they're very good for developing the ability to use those cohesive devices. Okay, next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'm conscious of the time, but a really important aspect of content and, ling and language integrated learning is the focus on genre, which comes from a functional approach to the use of language in society. So um, this was a later development. Um, Michael Halliday is responsible for this and also Martin. Um, a genre is a purposeful activity. A, a genre refers to the type of text that's produced. So you can have both spoken and written genre. For example, a spoken genre is a conversation, an interview, a written. We know a lot about written genre, um, a an essay, um, a letter, a letter to the newspaper. Um, another um, oral genre is um, a speech, which has properties that are closer to the written form than to the usual spoken form. Spoken text is usually spontaneous and loosely structured, okay? Um, we Like I'm doing today, um, although I've prepared my presentation, I'm not reading from my slides. I'm talking to them and explaining what I've got on the slides to help give you examples of the points I've got on there. But a written text is usually planned and highly structured, okay? So one of the um, aspects of content and language integrated learning approaches is the development of knowledge of the structure and the forms, the properties of particular genres. Okay, next slide, please. Oops. Okay. Now, the next few slides, I've just provided some ideas um, to lead into the activities that I've um, prepared for you to look at in um, about five minutes time. Okay, some ways of providing comprehensible input. So these are just um, some activities or some activities that, you, that a teacher can use in order for the text, the input that the students are going to be given to develop their language, how that can be. This, I've only chosen a small number. There are lots and lots of ways of providing comprehensible input, negotiating meaning as well, um, scaffolding techniques, and I haven't talked about that at all, but scaffolding is an extremely important aspect today of um, communicative language teaching and learning. And again, um, this is the implicit approach to the teaching of gra English grammar rather than an explicit approach. So it's a reactive approach to focus on form more than a proactive one. Okay, um, next slide, please. Sorry, I've moved a long way. Um, some ways of encouraging comprehensible input. Um, the best way, of course, is using question and answer. Either the teacher with the whole class or um, give the students a responsibility, give one student a set of questions and the, the partner has to answer them and then um, swap over. Um, one of the key ways of developing grammatical competence in English, as Meryl Swain has po pointed out and as she's shown in the studies that she's done, is to use a dictogloss. 
Um, just wave your hand. Are you familiar with dictogloss? Wave your hand if yes. No, nobody's hand's gone up. Okay. All right. I'll just briefly explain dictogloss. Um, I've used it as well in my teaching, particularly with adolescents and also at university. Um, it's a really challenging activity, but it's great fun and very, very, it produces a lot of language and a lot of awareness about the grammatical structures. So a dictogloss activity, um, the teacher chooses a, a short passage, um, a paragraph of, say, approximately eight sentences, eight to ten sentences around on a particular topic. And that passage um, is read to the students who take notes. It's not dictation, okay? So they don't, they're not writing down, they're not writing down word by word what the teacher's saying. In fact, the teacher delivers the message, um, the information, um, much more quickly than um, he or she would in a dictation exercise. So um, the students listen to the passage, they take some notes, um, main ideas, vocab around those main ideas. The passage is then read again and the students take some more notes. And then the students work in pairs or in small groups to reconstitute to um, uh, it, to reconstitute the passage that they've heard. And one of the good things about dictogloss is that when they're working together to reconstitute the original text, they focus what Swain's research has shown and, and mine did too, is the students focus not just on the vocab, the lexical items, but they also focus on the grammar, okay? And they ask each other questions about the grammar, like, um, so was it in, was that the past tense or the present tense? Was it a future? What preposition was it? Was it of or on or for? And so they developed through dictogloss. It's a really good way of developing students' awareness of particular grammatical features of the text. It's well worthwhile trying for teachers. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we're coming to, um, so you would have been given uh, two activities, a text-based activity. I've chosen Indonesian rainforest for, for both of these activities. Um, I don't know if we're going to have time to do the activities that your the tasks I've got is your task now, but we'll we'll run through these two activities that I've designed because I'd like to move on to questions um, and comments um, that you've got. Okay, so um, this would be the type of activity that you would use in a content and language integrated learning approach. But it, would, it can also be an activity that you can use in a normal English course, um, which is topic based. OK, so let's say the topic is um, the challenges to the environment, global challenges to the environment. And one of the global challenges is rainforests in Indonesia, in um, Malaysia, in um, South America, in, in um, the Aztec area. Um, okay, so this is the activity. After reading the text, write a formal letter to the Minister for the Environment, providing your ideas about how to protect Indonesia's rainforests. So these are the language aims. At the end of the activity, learners can write a formal letter to a government official, organize their points logically in linked paragraphs, use appropriate examples to support their point of view, write using appropriate tenses, use appropriate connectives. So you can see by the language aims that the focus is on the discourse level of English, but it's also under, but the activity is underpinned by an acknowledgement that in order to achieve those discourse aims of writing the formal letter, organizing the points logically, providing appropriate examples, they have to be able to choose the correct tenses, 
and they have to be able to use appropriate connecting words or discourse markers in the activity. And so your task was going to be list the language needed, key lexical and grammatical items for this text. So what would, and decide on one, some ways that you would activate the language to guide learners to understand the text. I'm going to move on to the next activity um, because I really want to come back to um, questions from you. Okay, so, um, oops, so that's, um, that's the activity and here's the text. So we'll skip through the text. Um, you, students, you can have a look at this at your leisure later on, okay? So we'll just skip through the text and go to the topic, a tour of an Indonesian rainforest, please. I think it's about three slides along. So that's my text-based activity. The task-based activity, which we're going to get to as soon as, um, could you move the slides on to the slide, um, a tour of an Indonesian rainforest, please? Thank you. One, two more. One more. One more. That's it. Thank you. Okay. This is an example of a task-based activity. Um, and I've used these particular activities a lot in my curriculum design and unit development subject at Monash University, which had lots of, always had lots of Indonesian students in it. Okay, so I've used the Indonesian rainforest as well. And you can see that, I hope you'll be able to see um, how this task-based activity is both in depth, but also broad. So this is the activity. Your travel company is setting up a new tour through Indonesian rainforests in Bali and Borneo. You have to research the area in one of these places where you'll be taking a group of six Australian tourists. So you've, in terms of communicative language teaching, you've given the students the location, you've given them the people involved. So that makes you think about, hopefully it makes students think about the socio-cultural, sociolinguistic competence that they will need. You will need a map. You will need to map a route, plan the tour, and prepare a brochure to advertise it. So you've got three different kinds of discourse that the students have to prepare. Notice that the map doesn't require a lot of language, okay? Planning the tour will require more and we'll look at the different aspects when we see the language aims. And preparing the brochure will require another level of competence, of discourse competence. So we're moving from simple discourse, um, preparing a map to intermediate, bit harder, planning the tour that can be presented in dot point form, doesn't have to be in sentences or in paragraph, and then the preparation of the brochure, which will need students to be able to produce paragraph, um, paragraphs in the language and therefore focus on the discourse level, extended discourse level. This is what they have to include. So they've got to have a title and an attractive title page with the name and the contact details an introduction about where the tour will go. So that's paragraph level discourse. A map with the route, I've been over that. Information about the things the group will see and do on the trip, including landscape, any cultural aspects, people and animals they might need. This is a significant part of the research the students will have to do to be able to respond to that particular um, point um, of this task base, this project. And so that's where the teacher will need to be able to point the students in the direction of resources that they will be able to cope with in English. And in, in, in some approaches, there would be no problem about them researching that in Indonesian, but then they have to transfer that knowledge into English. So they have to translanguage. 
they have to produce a list of items each member of the tour group must bring and also a reason why they need these. So although you've got a list, which is easy, there's got to be a reason, which just ups the level of the grammatical need. A menu of the food and drinks they'll be having. Again, a list. It's not very complicated. Next slide, please. They'll need to ha make, have a statement about what um, the, the people taking the tour can look forward to experiencing by joining this tour. That's fairly challenging. That requires a fairly high level of analysis and um, of language. So they've got to hypothesise what these people will enjoy and maybe even justify it. I included a risk assessment chart because in today this is absolutely essential for any tour company, right? So this is a realistic task-based approach or realistic project so that, that they have to um, come up with a list of dangers, but they've also got to have ideas for ways to avoid those dangers. And that, as I just said, that's essential these days. So it's very authentic. Okay, the language aims. Write an informative brochure for a group tour of a rainforest. Describe characteristics of the rainforest. So that's your discourse level. Organise the text into a clear brochure, again, discourse level. Write using appropriate tenses, sentence level, grammatical knowledge. Scan information on the web to take notes of possible dangers in a rainforest. Um, and so vocabulary and grammar, because they're going to condense that information that they find on the web down to the risk assessment chart. So that's condensing language from text to point form, a really good skill um, in not just in learning a language, but a really good skill um, from ed educational skill. And then I was going to get you to list the language needed, the lexical and grammatical items, and we were going to talk about ways of activating that. But we're not going to have time because we're getting to the end of this presentation. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. So I'm going to finish off now um, by looking at some challenges and some rewards that I believe can come from taking a communicative approach to English language grammar. The challenges I've produced are from the teacher's point of view, uh, and I'll talk a little about, a bit about some challenges for students when I've gone through these. So I think um, from my own experience as a teacher, I think designing learning activities with a balance on of, a, of the focus on meaning and form is really challenging. And if we'd had time to do those activities around the text and the task-based um, project, I think we would have seen that firsthand. It is not easy. It's really challenging. Recycling vocabulary and gra grammatical structures previously introduced when we had a purely grammatical approach to teaching and learning English in the textbook, the vocab was recycled, or, and sometimes it wasn't, but there was um, a, a sequential development, a, a quasi-sequential development of grammatical structures and vocab knowledge. I think another challenge is predicting the context which a second language learners will operate in. You don't know where your learners and you as students, you don't know where after your English language course you're going to go and you're going to be using English. And in fact, not just in the future, but now when you leave the classroom, what context do you use English in? Has what you've learned in the classroom helped you with that? Is it going to help you with that? Another big challenge, and we found this in Australia, um, uh, it, particularly with content and language integrated learning approaches, even in primary schools. Non-native speaking teachers don't feel particularly comfortable with changing from being a, an authoritative person, the person who knows everything, directs all the activities in the classroom, to just being a facilitator, to setting up an activity like that task-based learning one 
or like that text-based learning one that I've just shown you, and then letting the students go and then drawing them back at the end, um, collecting the work and then providing them with feedback on their work. And then out of the work they've produced, knowing what grammatical structures need to be revised or taught explicitly. Another challenge which I spoke about before is national exams, and in particular those which focus on linguistic knowledge and competence, in other words, on accuracy, knowing the right form and getting it right. And the last one, which I see as both a challenge and a reward of um, using a communicative approach to English language grammar, is building student and teacher confidence. I think that can be a challenge, but I think it can also be very rewarding. Have the next slide, please. Okay, some rewards. It's true, and it's been shown by a lot, most of the research, that the language taught and learned is authentic, meaningful, and current or up to date. Learners are able to construct and deliver a message successfully in English. They don't have to wait for a whole semester or a whole year or a couple of years in order to be able to produce comprehensible, intelligible, meaningful messages in English, which is was what the case was in a traditional grammatical approach. Teachers and learners can engage in dialogic interactive discourse. In other words, the classroom is a conversational setting where teachers and learners engage in English together to build knowledge around topic and knowledge around the structure, the grammar of English. Language learning is less about memorising vocab and grammar rules and more about interacting in the target language. What a amazing um, success story that would be that the learners feel comfortable interacting in the target language with each other and the teacher. It's a natural thing to do in English and not um, moving between Indonesian and English or English and Indonesian. Focusing on forms by drawing learners' attention to these via corrective feedback, as I mentioned earlier, is equally as important as focus on meaning. I think that was one of the big debates in the, in the 1990s was some teachers were really afraid that taking a communicative approach to teaching English and in particular to teaching English grammar would mean that there wasn't enough focus on form focus on grammatical structures, that grammar would be forgotten. But that's not the case. It's really important that there's that balance, as I said before, between focusing on meaning and focusing on grammatical forms. But the reward is that the focus on the grammatical elements or forms is not isolated from communication or constructing meaningful texts. It's a natural part of them. Okay, um, the last slide is just references for your information. And so now we can come to your questions. And there are three in the chat. Okay, big moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Margaret. It's really insightful, meaningful. Uh, it's time for question and session. Uh, Mas Imran, which you handle well. Uh, for for your information, Dr. Margaret, we have a uh, the head, uh, English Education Department, Bu Saidah. Yeah, Bu Saidah, want to say something? No. To Dr. Margaret? No, no, no. No, no, no. no okay. Uh, directly, Mas Imron, yeah, the handle, handle, question. Yeah. Uh, okay, so today we have asking question sessions for student who gonna ask, you may come forward and asking the questions. Uh, there's a question in the chat that I'd like to answer, if that's okay. Okay, I, I will ask the I will read the questions in chat. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I will read it. In Indonesia, people learn English even from elementary school until senior high school, but 
there are a lot of people still cannot speak English in correct grammar. So what should the teacher do to make students use communicative grammar, not only in writing, but also in speaking ability? Okay, that's the subject. <laughs> Hopefully I've answered that question in what I've just talked about, okay? And in particular in the challenges and rewards. But I think the most important answer to that question is um, that there has to be, that the teacher has to be aware that there needs to be explicit focus on correct grammatical forms um, at the end of every topic, okay? So th this is what makes communicative language teaching using communicative English grammar a lot more difficult um, and challenging and time-consuming than a traditional approach. So what the teacher has to do, and I know that when I was doing it, um, I had to really change the way that I prepared and followed up on, on um, content. So it is really important is it, it's really important to look at the errors the students are making at the time they're making them and go over what the correct forms are and practice them. In a communicative approach, there is no um, problem. It's not forbidden to do grammar practice exercises. And that's what we do here. We set them as homework, but we make sure that the students do at least once a week grammar practice exercises that um, are related to the mistakes they're making in the topic that they've just that they're doing. Okay, I hope that answers it. Okay, um, six minutes. Communicative. Do you think that non-standardized English grammar will spoil the English language itself? Oh. <laughs> that's a very subjective question. <laughs> um, look, I think, um, thank you for your question, um, the person who's in Mr. Dovick's um, lecture. Um, Non-standard English grammar will always be unacceptable in certain situations, okay? Non-standard English grammar is very acceptable among young people in social situations. But when you get into more formal contexts, more formal situations, it's definitely not acceptable. I mean, it, it's very different here in Australia, I think, to England, for example, and even to New Zealand. In Australia, we tend to be more accepting of young people using non-standard grammar but when they go for a job interview, for example, or when they're interacting with clients in um, the work that they do, it's definitely not acceptable. So one of the important things about a communicative approach is that learners have to recognise, be aware of, learn when you can use non-standard English grammar, but when you must use the correct standard forms. And that's really important. I hope that answers that first question. Second question, do you think someday there will be universal language for all nations? Why? Well, I think there already is, and it's called English, unfortunately. I think it's most unfortunate that English has become the lingua franca, um, the universal language for all nations. Uh, and why do I think that? Because I think that it detracts from the language and the culture of those nations which have um, really, really important lessons, wisdoms, cultural practices, um, stories that everybody can learn from. Um, you can't learn lots of different things by just looking at English languages and cultures, okay? We don't have the... Um, we don't have the um, we don't have the right to impose English on everyone. I think that that personally, I think that's very wrong. Nadia, I think that's it. Are there any other questions? Masimon, is there any other question? Okay. I have questions for. Yeah. 
Dr. Margaret. Uh, so today, by the evolutions of globalizations, many people like students are misunderstanding about language, like the evolution of grammatical and the evolution of vocabulary. So this is, has been uh, proven by students who doesn't know the English language, especially in Indonesian, a third language, not second language. So how to resolve these problems where we are Indonesian students and also Indonesians is called by developing country, not advanced country. So thank you for the answers. Could you, could you please repeat your question slowly and in different parts? Okay, so the question is how we to resolve the problems where the evolutions of language and vocabulary are more faster and Indonesians is developing country in different country we we don't really uh, i mean we don't really like want to face it faster so how to resolve that problem thank you okay very good question <laughs> very good question and very difficult question yes you're right um the speed of evolution and changes to the english language uh, is amazing okay and I don't think that we can ever keep up with that. I think what we have to do is we have to be realistic about what English, what English grammatical items, what English grammar, um, and there has to be a standard form that's taught in foreign language situations so that everybody has the same base for understanding everyone else. I don't think it's possible to teach a range of different English grammars, even though these English grammars are evolving very rapidly, very quickly in the current world, and the vocabulary is changing very rapidly and quickly as well. I think we still have to look at the dictionaries that are produced, um, and those dictionaries are now adding different lexical items which are more up-to-date um, and not necessarily totally accepted. But I think the grammatical aspect is we have to go back to um, what is considered acceptable standard English with some variations. I think variations in vocabulary and in grammar are really for the very experienced and very proficient learners. I think there's, there's, there's got to be a base Sorry, I'm very French in my approach. This is the way the French operate is. They have an academy which dictates what the language is and the grammar. Um, and English doesn't have that. And that's what makes it so difficult. But I think that we do have to say, okay, what's an acceptable um, standard grammar? Who produces that? The Americans will produce a different one to the British, okay? And Australian English is sort of slides between American English and British English. But um, I think we have to make the choice of are we going to teach, and, and this is a choice that's been made for many years now, at least 30, maybe even 40 years. Are we going to teach standard American English? Are we going to teach standard British English? But if we choose one or the other, it, it is our responsibility as teachers to always draw students' attention to the fact that this is standard English for America, this is standard English for Britain, but Australians, New Zealanders, other people say it in a slightly different way. But the important thing is to be understood, to produce a comprehensible and meaningful and intelligible comprehensible message. That might contain some errors, which, which um, and we don't criticise the errors. I hope that answers your question. It was a very good question. Okay, I think enough for a uh, question and solution. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, sorry, oh, yeah, Dia. Yeah, yeah, actually, I, I wanna, I wanna ask some questions, but uh, sorry for oh, um, yeah, the trouble Mama. with my camera. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, I okay. have trouble with Mama my camera. Mam bagian yang ini sambutan sekalian, Mam. Oh, 
Um, hello, Margaret. Sorry, yes. I have trouble with my cam camera. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, you tell us about uh, CLIL, Content Language Integrated Learning. Uh, does it same thing as content-based learning? No, no. So content-based learning, um, it was, uh, um, content-based learning was created in America for English as second language learners, mainly adults, uh, senior high school, okay? Um, and it's content-based learning's focus is on English language, improving English language. CLIL, Content and Language Integrated Learning, is a European concept. It was created in Europe so that learners could learn a, an academic discipline through another language, mainly English, and the focus is on developing both language and content knowledge. So CBLT, content-based teaching, is the focus is on developing learners' language competence, vocab and grammar, discourse forms. Clear, it's both subject, discipline and language. That's the difference. Okay, thank you. That's okay. Um, and your second question, CT? Yeah, my second question says uh, uh, th there are seven principles of communicative language learning and uh, two of the principles are multiple varieties of language are recognized. And the other one is no single methodology for language learning. And my question is, uh, what does it mean by multiple varieties of language are recognized? And if there is no single methodology for language learning, does it mean that uh, in communicative language uh, learning, it is suggested to modify more than one method in our teaching learning process? Yes. Okay, so um, in today's communicative language teaching, I think um, a more eclectic approach has been taken. So it, it, communicative language teaching consists of a number of different approaches. We can draw, we draw on the best elements from structural audiolingualism, from early communicative language teaching, from later communicative language teaching. So the purpose of today's communicative language teaching approaches um, is to address the needs of the students. So what, do the, what are the goals for the students from this course and and how do the students learn? What sorts of learners are they? How do they like to learn? And then develop different approaches to meet the needs, the interests, and the learning um, the learning approach. Sorry, I'm getting tired. <laughs> the learning styles of um, the students in front of us. Actually, that's a topic for another whole seminar, Nadia. <laughs> Thank you, Siti. That's a topic for another whole seminar. It's a very good okay. question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mom. Mom, sekalian mau ini uh, short speech sambutan, Mom. Uh, Bu Siti Tarwia, Bu Dr. Siti Tarwia is a head of international class, uh, Dr. Margaret. And there is also Bu Saida as a head of English education. Uh, could you please, Mam Tarwia dan Bu Saida? Yeah, okay. Or closing. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for um, having class with you. It's a very meaningful class, and we really propose to have another class with you if you don't feel objected, Miss Margaret, Mrs. Margaret. That's okay. Okay, so thank you, thank you. That's very kind of you. Yeah. Okay, Bu, Bu, Bu Arni will maybe will send an email regarding the second proposal for you. Okay. To have another class with you. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. I'm very honored. Thank you very much, uh, Mom Sitarvia. Next, uh, 
the head of English Education Department, Musaida, want to say something? No, okay. Yes, uh, she is still in a meeting with uh, the dean, <laughs> oh, Dr. Margaret. Well, thank you very much, uh, participant. Thank you very much. Very great uh, question and. Ibu Dr. Margaret, thank you very much for your uh, explanation. It's really insightful. Yeah, it's a really challenging to practice, <laughs> to implement. Well, uh, well, uh, for the last session, let's uh, take a picture together. A photo session. Mas Ahmad Dahlan, ya, tolong di Bu Safaah juga minta tolong terutama yang ini laptop yang ada tulisan jamnya. Everybody, could you please uh, on your camera? Apa Bu Safaah yang dihitung? Dr. Margaret, uh, it's uh, our tradition to take a picture together. Bu Safaah yang hitung aja ya Bu Safaah. I will count, yeah. Uh... Please give your sweetest smile. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the participants to open their video. Okay, so there are, there are two, oh, only two slides. So I will take two pictures. Yeah, I will count one, two, three, cheese. Okay. One more, white. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, cheese. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Kembali ke siapa, Bu Arni? Ke moderator ya, Mas. Oh iya, Mas Imron. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Margaret. Today is closing times, and I will give to the master of ceremony. Thank you, and uh, your nice explanations about comparative English grammar. So I can really have some opinions about it, and maybe some students will understood what you have been explained today. So thank you very much, and. Uh, hopefully, we will meet you in some day in, in next times. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, for the last agenda is closing. Let's close our agenda today by saying Alhamdulillah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, say hello to Mar. Margaret for. Okay. Can you please? Thank you, Dr. Margaret. Bye, Nadia. Thank you so much. See you again later in another opportunity, Margaret. I will contact you for you. further information. Okay, thank you very much. I'm really on it. It's a pleasure to work with you. Yeah. Okay, thank you for this, all of the students uh, that uh, joined this meeting, this uh, course, both online and offline. Thanks for your participation and see you again in the next event. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Okay, bye bye, Dr. Margaret. Bye, Nadia. Thank you so much. Thank you bye, so Ani. Much. Have a nice day. You too. Yeah.
Thank you, Bunadia. Thank you, Margaret. Oh, thank you, Annie. You are nice. It's a very golden opportunity for us to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm coming. Two. About two, yeah. Good boy. Okay. Thank you, Busayid. Ditutup aja semuanya. Close, yeah. I will stop the recording.